Okay, so let us resume the morning session. And next talk is the rough, smooth boundary in diamond models by Ku Johnson. Okay, thank you very much, and thanks a lot for the invitation to come here, particularly to Filippo here. So yes, I will talk about the rough, smooth boundary in diamond models for, and the model I will talk about is, you see, a realization here of the so-called two-periodic Aztec diamond. And some of you were here last week, then you heard uh, Maurice Deutz also talk about this model. So, but I, I will focus on some other things. In you can see that you sort of have no, I don't. You know, three re type of, of behavior here, right? You have a sort of completely rigid thing here. Here there is some other kind of randomness, and here there is a third randomness. So I will refer to this as smooth, rough, and frozen, and I will come back to this terminology in soon. So I want to understand in particular the region here between this smooth region and this rough region here. This is what the talk will be about, and I will explain the model also what it is. So you should actually think of a very large picture like this, much, much larger than this. We're with, you should think of a big but finite object still, right? So that's what we should have in mind. So here's, no. here's a larger simulation, still much smaller than we should actually think about. But you can see that there is a clear geometry also appearing in, in, in this picture, right? So what, what is it that you see? So let me define the model here. So the, the shape here, the boundary shape here is the so-called Aztec diamond shape. And this is covered, as you can see, by two by one dominoes here. And you have basically here two types. You could think of the red one as vertical and the blue one as horizontal. But you can also think of this as the so-called dimer model, right? Where you see you have this underlying graph that you see in black there. And, you have, and the dominoes can be thought of as dimers covering this graph here. So dimer means that each vertex is covered exactly once by these dimers here. Then all Everything is covered, as you see. So, so this is an equivalent way. So we can think of this as a dimer model. So, so you call the two periodic Aztec diamond here. So I have to assign weights, to give a probability measure on this space of all these dimer covers there. So each edge is assigned a positive weight here. So the edge E has some weight nu of e here and then the if you have a dimer cover as i said each vertex is covered exactly once by this dimer then the weight of the whole configuration is just the product of all the weights of the cover of the edges that cover these are covered then right then c is of course the normalization the partition function of this dimer model so what I have here is a special choice of this weight here, which is two periodic in the following way. There are different, there's not a unique way of, of describing the weights. I mean, there are many equivalent ways, but this is one way of doing it. So I alternate between two types of weights here, A and B, and all the edges around this face here marked by an A are given weight A, and all the edges around here are given weight B. And in this way, you get this sort of two periodicity because they alternate B, A, B, A, and so on in both directions. So edges covered, which have weight A, I will call A edges. This will come back a bit later in the talk, and the other ones are B edges. And Actually, I can set this B equal to one, as I will often do, and without any loss of generality. So there is sort of one parameter which will be A. So you should think of this as something between zero and one. Then. 
So when it's equal to one and B is equal to one, then it's just a uniform choice here, right? Which is called the standard Aztec diamond. So there is another picture behind here, which is you can think of this as a height model, also a random height function. So you can assign heights to the faces here in this Aztec diamond graph. So this is the graph that we saw earlier. So I, I define the height to be zero here. And then I have a rule for how the height changes as you move between the faces here. So the, each face has a certain height here. And the rule is that if I cross a diamond with a white vertex to the right, then I go up by three. So this is what you do here. You go from zero to three. And if I cross with a white vertex to the right, but there is no diamond, I go down by one. And of course, with the opposite signs, if you go in the other direction, so here you would go up by one because the white vertex is at the left. So in this way, you can see that if I, I assign the height here, then there is a unique height defined everywhere. And within a certain class of, of height, possible height functions, this, this is sort of a unique, another representation of, of the dimer cover there. So of course, if you vary, start to vary the, the, the dimers, you will get different height functions here now. So this, in this way, we get the random height model here also. Okay, and, and, and the heights at the boundary here are fixed. There is a fixed boundary condition here for the height. Then. And this is sort of what corresponds to the shape here. The Aztec diamond shape is that I define a certain boundary height function here. But is it obvious that the height must be like plus two minus two on the like diagonal, like I see five, seven, five, three, four, six, four, two. It's obvious that it's gonna happen like that or? You know, when you go. Yeah, you go like horizontally, you see five, seven, five, three, and then six, four, six, four, two. So it's always like difference of two. Uh, is something that happened in this case or is it a general feature? Like here, you're pointing like it's five. Then on the left, there is a three. three so. yeah. On the top. On the top. Yeah. On the top. Yeah. 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 Well, there will be certain. Yeah. You. Yeah. You have to. You can. There will be some some patterns like. But you could, if you start to change this, you would. You you could have a. Maybe this is a bit too special in that way. Right. But you can, of course, you cannot change much, right? If you just go in one step, right? So there is, there is a definite pattern there. They actually, you see it better in, 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 in another picture because there is a kind of interlacing structure here. So it's sort of, when, when you start to move in from the boundary, things can only happen at one point. So there is one point, you see there is five, three, one, three there, right? But you could shift where this one is like this. Right? So there is a special, there are, as, as you, so in a way, as you move away from the boundary, the restrictions become less somehow, right? Yeah. So here, here's a realization, and here you can see it, what you, we saw in the initial picture here in the talk. We saw these kind, three kinds of regions here now. So this is the middle region. Here you can see that it sort of seems to be flat here. But there are some disturbances here. In this, these regions, which are called frozen, it's sort of completely flat. So that, that corresponds to sort of facets in this, in this height picture. And, the, and this smooth region, as I call it, is also sort of asymptotically flat, but has some small disturbances. Here, in this rough region, it, height goes up and down a bit more, right? So it, 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 it's rougher in this sense. So this terminology goes back to the study of random height functions. There's something called the roughening transition that has been much studied in statistical physics. I will not survey that at all. So there are models like the solid on solid model where you have a transition from this kind of smooth surface, with sm which is essentially 
flat, but with some small disturbances to a much rougher surface with la much larger variance fluctuations in the height. So that's called a roughening transition that you vary at some parameter typically like the temperature. So here we sort of see this transition in, in sort of in a spatial, instead of varying a parameter, we are changing where we are in the picture and you see these different types of behavior, right? So in this, what I'm interested in from this point of view is sort of the boundary between the smooth and the rough face, hence the title of the talk, right? So the terminology comes from, from, from th this kind of picture. They're often, when you look at them as random tilings, also often called the gas, the liquid, and the frozen region, right? But Herbert Spohn always tells me that I should not use that terminology. And in a way, this terminology with smooth, smooth rough, and frozen is better in that way, particularly when you think about it as this height model. So if you take the ordinary Aztec diamond, so uniform choice here, then this, this smooth face, this flat region in the middle disappears and you get this kind of picture instead. So this would be when this A and B are both equal to one there. You still have this facet to rough boundary here, which you can sort of see here also. So I will, I will talk a little about that and contrast what sort of what we see there with what we see at the other, at the other boundary here. Contrast in the sense of how can we understand it. So as you can see, if I just go back here again, you can see that it looks like sort of if we took a limit here when this whole region grows, but we rescale it back to size unity, then, then we should in the limit see some kind of surface, or some, some kind of, of limiting surface. And this is indeed the case. There is a variational principle describing this limiting surface, which goes back to Cone Canyon and Prop. So there is, you have a certain function, sort of a surface tension, which contains this parameter, sort of the underlying, depends on the underlying weight structure that I had. And, of course, that, and this is in a certain region, this square region that you saw, and there is, of course, this boundary condition also, right? So you take the infimum of all height conditions in this sort of, so you have a, you, it involves the gradient then of the height function, right? So properties of this was investigated later also by Kenyon and Okunko in a well-known paper which has analytical gaps in it. So a recent breakthrough work with a very different methods and which is also more rigorous in this way is by Astla, Duse, Praus and Schong diamond models and conformal structures. So they investigate in a quite large class of models with having some periodic weight structure, what kind of geometry you can have and what's the regularity. So in Prince, in particular, they probe something which goes back to the physics literature called the pokrovsky talapov law, which says that as you, if D is sort of the distance to, to, the, to the boundaries between these type of faces that you have, then the height function has this regularity, D to the power three halves. And here you see a certain similar, if so, yeah, maybe I'll come back to that later. So there is the, this, this regularity that you expect at these boundaries there of the height function. Okay, so in the limit, you also get this kind of picture then where you have this types of, of behavior then for the height functions, frozen, rough, and smooth. And it's given by a certain degree eight algebraic curve, the two real components of this curve. So what we would sort of, I'd like to sort of zoom in here somewhere close to this boundary between these rough and smooth regions and understand what we see in, in a large but still finite picture. There, right? So. One way you can think about this now is, it, is of course, so in this picture, I sort of 
we rescale, so in the, the whole picture is a finite thing, right? I see these surfaces and these regions, right? But I could also zoom in locally at the, at the length scale or the lattice spacings. I really see the dimers or, or the, I walk around about, among these tiles or dimers, right? And I could, what are the correlations between these dimers? How do, how do they correlate? And what is the behavior of the dimers statistically in these different regions? So there is work from about 20 years ago by Kenyon Okunko of Sheffield where they classified within a certain class of these periodic models then which kind of, of these limiting Gibbs measures that you would have then that you can get. And they come in, in three categories then, ju just the type of three types of regions that we saw in this model here, namely frozen, rough and smooth, although they call them frozen, liquid and gas then. And the distinction of frozen, you see, that was this facet, right? This is completely rigid, right? Whereas in the, in the rough phase, the correlation between the dimers in this infinite, now, Gibbs measure, right? So I, I, I'm standing locally, I take a limit, and send everything and the size to infinity. Then I see in whole, full plane Gibbs measure here, right? So they come into these three types. And, and the distinction between rough and smooth there that if I'm in the rough region, then the correlation decay like one over distance squared essentially in, in the limit. Whereas in the smooth phase, they decay exponentially. So this sort of distinguishes them, right? So in a way, when we're moving from this smooth region into this rough region, there is a change in the correlation between these dimers, right? So, and this is what I would like to understand. What, it, how is, what happens there? I mean, what is this change? I mean, we change behavior of, of the dimers. But as I said, you should think that we're still in a fine, this is in the limit, right? That now I sort of sent everything to infinity and I have this limiting infinite Gibbs measure, right? But what, what, what is actually happening in the finite model? How does it change, right? And we will see actually that this distinction is in practice, when you're looking in this region, not so clear. I mean, here it says so clear, either exponential or polynomial. This should be a clear, right? But, but what happens in between there, right? So, but let me start to, by discussing the frozen rough boundary a bit. And a, di a difference between, a difference between this boundary and the other boundary, which is maybe not so clear when you just look at the pictures I showed in the beginning, these pictures are a little clever in a, in a way because the fact that you see these boundaries so clearly, the smooth rough boundaries, due to the way it's colored in a way. So I will, I will indicate this a bit here. So it's actually not, here, here you can see the boundary is, is clear, right? There is a, a sort of a combinatorial thing you can define in a finite model combinatorially, right, which gives you the boundary. So you have this rigid pattern, brick work pattern, and yeah? the first time you see anything different, that's where the boundary is, right? So this I can define in a finite model and then study what happens in the limit. So it's a well-defined curve here whose scaling limit I can study, right? Another way to, of seeing this is you can define particles in, instead. So these particles also appeared in the talk of Maurice Deutz last week. Then. But, so you, you can put particles on the dimers in this way. You have this, it's this bipartite graph that we had, and we put colors, blue and red, in this way. And say that I look at the, at the blue particles here. So there's first one, then there's two, then there's three. So you would, I would actually start with having just one and they will interlace, two, three, and so on. So this is actually the pattern which I was alluding to 
for the question before here, right? So what you see then, that this, the boundary here is actually given by a lost particle here, right? Or here by a lost hole. And this, these particles form a determinantal point process. We have sort of free fermions here. And in the, in the framework of, of the determinantal processes, the last particle distribution is something which is easy to get at, because this is sort of what's called a gap or hole probability, the probability of not seeing any particles, right? And this, within the framework of determinantal process, this is given by a Fredholm determinant and something you can take the limit of in a good way. So this is a very good situation. If we know the correlation kernel of, the, of, the, of this particle process, we can compute things with that compute what kind of boundary we see here. So, so this, this, this is why, so we both have a good combinatorial definition of the boundary, we can find it as a last particle. So, so that's why this frozen rough boundary is something which is relatively easy to compute, right? So what should we have get in the limit? So if I go back here, we have, we have this, curve here, right? So it's sort of like a random walk curve, right? It goes up and down somehow like this. And we would like to take a scaling limit of that. And the, the right scaling limit here, if I just draw a small picture here, is that, so we, we, have, we have this curve here, and it, it turns out that the fluctuations in this direction is like the size to n to the one third, and the correlation sort of how they correlate in the other direction has this scale n to the two-thirds. So the relation between just is just like the Brownian scaling, right? With this is the square root of this one, right? So locally it's like a, like a random walk and in the limit the Brownian motion, but the, it's globally correlated at these distances. So this is something called the airy process, is the appropriate scaling limit of this curve. And this is realized as one way, I'll just be a bit brief here now about the technical things. Many of you may have probably seen this before, but you, you can, you, there is a, something called the airy line ensemble here. And the top curve of this is this airy process. And you can get this limit occurs in many models now. Well, the easiest one is probably to look at Dice, stationary Dyson Brownian motion, the one, the, the Brownian motion that Dyson defined in the 60s on Gaussian matrices, where GUE is the stationary distribution. If you zoom up, up, zoom in around the largest eigenvalue and see how that evolves and take the limit, you get this airy process. And it can be proved that in the ordinary Aztec diamond and also in many other models now that this is the limit you see in this frozen rough boundary then. So for example, Agarwal and Huang proved recently that you have this in a quite a large class of loss and tiling models at these frozen rough boundaries. So, I will not go really go into that. You can def so we saw the particles here, right? And I said that you should think you should look where you have these particles, and these particles in the limit are these particles that sort of sit at different times in this. So this is the scaling limit of these particles, right? And they are described by something called the extended airy point process, which you can define in terms of the extended area kernel and uh, Laplace times. But, but let, let me skip this, this part now. So there is a, this is a very precise point process that you see in the limit and the last particles form this, this area process. Right? So a natural question then is, do you say, see the same thing here? There seems to be a, some curve here. But it also, but it's not so clear exactly what you see there. Here it's again quite clear, right? There is something happens where nothing happens happened before. 
so, so he, here is I zoomed in in this picture at this rough frozen boundary and similar to the picture we saw in the ordinary asset diamond is completely frozen and then the first time you see something different then you have the boundary right here you see these paths but if i would zoom in here you would you see this path because of the choice of coloring here now so it's actually not completely clear what you see and if i move here you see okay some there is this kind of last pass. So we would guess naturally that this is also in the limit given by this airy process. But things happen, I mean, here it's completely frozen, but in this smooth phase here, things are still happening, right? So the, 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 what the boundary is here is not so clear. And you can see this in terms of these particles. If I define particles in the same way as we did previously, putting these particles on the on the dominoes as we did. Then again, here we see again this, the rough frozen boundary, and there is a last particle there again, right? So I could use, if I, and this will again form a determinantal process, I could go through with the same machinery. Okay, you see the, the smooth face here, but you see this is, there are lots of particles, right? What, where is the boundary here? I cannot, there is no last particle I can use to describe it here. Right? So this means that this boundary is a much more complicated object combinatorially. I mean, what would be the natural microscopic definition here? So what are these long paths that we see? And can we define the boundary here that converges to the area process? Yes? There is not, there, nothing is defined here. This is just a random sample colored in something where you see something, right? Oh. No, 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 this is just, you just, there are eight, there's eight grayscale colors here, right? I will come to what, how you can describe it, yes. Uh, in the other picture, on the, maybe on the next or previous slide, uh, it seems that in the, the smooth region you have the particles, they seem to form a, a pattern, a, a regular pattern with a, there are a few fluctuations, but still there is a, it seems that there is some sort of crystallization or something. Uh. Yes, I mean, the, yes. The, the, in terms of, of the height function, what you do, the relation of the particles to the height function is that you count the number of particles in a way, right? Mm -hmm. So, so, so he, here you would sort of, you see it's mostly particles and then you, you what this means is actually they're, they're counted with, a, there will be a sign here. So you sort of just go up and down, you sign flat, but sometimes there is a hole or there is a change and this corresponds to this small height fluctuation. So you can relate them, but it's not so clear where is the boundary here. Right? Sure. We saw it better in the other picture, but this is just something we happen to see because of the color, right? but in this picture, it's not, is it there or there? How should I define it? Right? But uh, wouldn't there be some sort of order parameter that would allow to detect the, the, the phase? I mean, there, there seems to be some sort of order parameter in this, uh, for this transition? I don't know how to define one. Yeah, yeah, there is yeah. no, yeah, you could imagine some asymptotic order parameter, but it's not, no, no, it, it's not so clear. There is in the sense of, of the fact that in the limit you have this surface and its geometry, right? And of course it's related to the, to the shape of the geometry of the limiting height function somehow. So in a way, maybe you will, a partial answer will come to what I will discuss next now, maybe. So before coming back to what we sort of see there, I want to talk about sort of this other problem I mentioned earlier that you have, what, what's the correlation between the diamonds? How does it change from exponential decay to power law decay? So the, mathema the mathematical story behind this is Castellane's method here now. So we had this for each edge which goes from say, say black to white vertex, there is a certain weight, right? We have this particular choice of weights. 
and I now introduce a, a sort of, um, this weighted adjacent matrix, but there is also an, a, a sort of sign kind of thing, the imaginary unit that I put in there. And then there is a, it's a theorem going back to Castlein that the determinant of this gives me the partition function. And from this you can deduce also, you can compute the probability of having edges, at, dimers at certain specified edges. Exactly these edges, these are covered. This has a certain probability which involves this, the inverse of this Castlein matrix. So this is a huge matrix, a fi huge finite matrix. You have to invert it and then you can compute probabilities. And actually the dimers, just like these particles, themselves form a determinantal point process with this kernel here. So you can actually compute, give a formula for this inverse. So this is the essential input here. This goes back to work on myself and Sunil Shita here some years ago, and Maurice Deutsch last week described other ways on how to get this inverse cast lanes in terms of this particle picture instead. So I will not, the formulas are rather complicated, just, just let me sort of fix upon some aspects of them, right? So this is what I'm talking about now is joint work with my PhD student Scott Mason there, and there is a recent preprint which gives the details of what I will say now. So, so this is the inverse Castley matrix. I've suppressed n now, so there is a parameter n also, the size of the whole Aztec diamond, right? This has two parts. These are sort of limiting parts. These have to do with, I will comment on that, of the limiting Gibbs measures that we see. This is an error term for the purposes I will talk about now, and this is also an error term. So X and Y are the core, I've chosen coordinates like this. So there's a Y axis and a, an X axis, and there, so you can see there are coordinates in this way, right? So the X and Y are, are points now in, in, this in this coordinate system, right? So if I actually zoom in at the edge and want to see the area function, which should be there somehow, this occurs in this thing here, but for the, in the R part. But for what I'm talking about now, I'm interested in looking at the dimers in, no, in large, but not too large distances. And then for this purpose, this is actually an error term. So this B, as I zoom in here, I want to move a bit inside the region here now, right? Into the rough region. So I, I and I do study this along the, this main diagonal here, right? So X, Xi measures where I am here, right? So when Xi is equal to Xi C here, then I'm exactly at this boundary here. So Xi should be a bit less than Xi C. Then I moved in a bit. So N times Xi C minus Xi, maybe that, so N times Xi C minus Xi, this tells me how far I've moved in in terms of the lattice basin. So this is sort of a parameter now. How far do I get in, go in here now? So that, that when you do the analysis, don't worry so much about the details. There is a certain function that this is sort of a saddle point functions that comes out of the analysis of the formulas and you, you prove an estimate of this R term here. So, so there are two asymptotics in a way, right? First, I take a very large N, right? And then I want to study distances between dimers, which is some distance r then say, right? And how that changes, right? With n fixed. So you have to do a sort of, so there is, you vary the parameters in the problem in this way. So there is, you have to do some kind of uniform asymptotic. So the first sort of n part is to show that this is not really important for, for what we're doing now. So, so, so I, I don't go into the details. So, so these, so there will be these two parts, which actually are sort of re re reflect aspects of the limiting Gibbs measures now. 
So they can be, I don't, don't worry about the technical, this can be expressed in certain integrals, right? So th this K11 inverse, this is the lim describes the limiting smooth phase here. And this is, a, this is something you start to add on when you move in. And together, they actually give the limiting Gibbs measures of a certain rough phase with parameters here, which would depend then on how far I moved in here now. Right? So I move in a certain distance like this, and you would have certain choices of S1 and S2, which would depend here on how far I moved in. But actually, I'm, I'm, so I'm, what I'm seeing in effect is a rough phase, but with, with some parameters which depend on N in this sense, right? How far I moved in. So the, the detailed analysis is about analyzing these kind of contour integrals, which is in a sense straightforward, but doing this in different directions and uniformly is quite involved. So that sort of takes a large part of the actual work in this, right? But this, let me come to the result instead. So, so what we do, if I draw a small, So, so the picture is this, so we have this, this, this thing here, right? And I'm, I'm looking here, so I'm moving in a bit here, so I'm look, going along this diagonal. Say that, that I take the correlation between dimers, which are par in, in this direction, because it is depend on, on which direction you move. For simplicity, let me consider this case. So what will we see? Well, what we will see is that first we see an exponential decay. So these, I, I, I'm, I'm not right at the boundary. I moved away. I'm not, you know, I'm not right at the edge. I, I moved in a certain distance, yes? I move into the rough, yeah. So when I increase psi c minus psi, I get more and more into the rough. So when, if psi c minus psi is about order unity, I'm really in the rough phase. Right? So first I would see an exponential decay here. So think again, I emphasize this, n is fixed, right? So I, I'm looking at this huge thing and now I'm changing the distance between the dimers, right? Then, I, then there's a long stretch actually where, this, where, the, where the correlation is constant. So I see this, this quick exponential decay, then it's actually constant. But then I start to see this, this power law decay. So when, if I, R is the distance between these two dimers and I rescale, I take D as a, so I take one over square root of psi c minus psi as another sort of reference distance, right? Then in this d, I see this kind of thing we expect here. So this is a bit mysterious because what I'm, what I'm saying here also is that what I'm seeing here is actually I'm in a certain rough phase, right? So we, we learn from the work that okay, we actually see a power law decay, right? But this is only true for very long distances now, right? First, I actually see a, an exponential decay. And then, then, then in a completely different length scale, I start to see another thing, right? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm just, don't understand. You have two dimers, right? Yes. So this is correlation function between two dimers. So there, this position R is for one of the dimers or for both, or how, how does it, it It's sort of the distance between this. I move in, so, so I move in a certain distance here. Do you see this? Or? Right, yeah, I see. I yeah, see yeah. That, yeah. You, I move in a certain distance, which you should think of as much, the picture is not so good, right? But then R is the distance between the dimers, right? So I first go in a long bit here into this rough region, okay. and then I start to vary here the distance between the dimers and see how that behaves. So you are assuming R smaller, much smaller than psi C minus psi, or not? Oh, sorry, you are giving the regime. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, so fine, yeah. Fine, fine. Oops. 
Yeah, there was, I have to move some distance in. And, and I should not be fully in, in the rough. No, I think that's right. Fully in the rough region, right? So, so what you see here is that there are actually two length scales that here. One is the lattice spacing. The other one is this, which comes out of the computation. And at, it's actually in this length scale that you see the power law decay. Whereas in the lattice spacing, if you just take that in it, what you see is, is this exponential decay, although you are in a sense in, in a rough phase. So it, it doesn't contradict, of course, what we knew that in the rough phase, we should have this power law decay, but it happens at a very long distance compared to the size of the, what, what we're really looking at. And the further in we go, so when Xi C, when Xi C minus Xi is of order one, so I'm really in the, in the rough phase, then, of, then these are of course of the same order and I see this, this behavior that I expect, right? Okay, I see I'm running out of time, so let me, just, I want to say a bit, this is something we started to work with, with Sunil and Vincent Pefara at our last meeting. So I think that <laughs> here seven years ago, right? So I, I'm thinking about what you actually see here, right? So let me end by saying a bit about that, but not being so detailed, right? So if you recall in the beginning there is sort of a distinction between two types of dimers they can we have this a ed, edges could have an a weight or a b weight right so if i let the edges the, the, the dimers which cover an a edge call them just a dimers right there is of course a symmetry here so i just choose one of them i could just as well choose the b dimers right we would see a similar thing so here, the red dimers here are, are the A dimers, and the black one are the B dimers, right? So here, you may start to see that if you look at these, you sort of see paths in the frozen things here. You have A dimer, A dimer, A dimer, I dimer. So they seem to sort of connect in a way, right? So there is this idea which Sunil had which is called squishing is that we you can sort of try to remove the b don't see the b dimer so you you contract the b faces here right so you sort of remove them so you make them smaller like this and the other one longer and then you can give them a direction here also from white to black say so then you see here the you get these connected lines now you get some double edges and you get something which you sort of start to see some paths here, right? And, but you can also get these kind of loops here, right? And if you connect this with, with the height picture, you can see that the, these actually capture the height picture also. I've removed some information here now because I took away these B edges, but in, in this terms of the so called the big picture here now of the heights or even the local but you see I sort of have height four eight twelve so I jump in four here so th these actually these long structures you have you see they sort of give the bound the, some kind of level lines for the for the height picture that you have here but of course you can have loops and this will also give you these jumps right and this is what you you see in this smooth face that there are many of these loops you jump a bit up and down of course you can have loops within loops and so on right if you had a large picture here right but here you can see start so these what you saw in these pictures these long lines are actually and they're emphasized by the coloring you see these a edges actually there is a you have to be a bit precise here about you know, what is a loop and what is a path here right so so here i mean should i go like this or like this so you can remove this by introducing these mirrors so that means that there is a a definite 
split between loops and paths, right? So after the squishing, you have this kind of picture. And here we have a candidate now for what the sort of combinatorial boundary should be in a finite picture. You sh there is this path here now, and this, this path is what we would hope converges to this area process here also. Right? So here is what it looks like after the squishing. So that you have these paths which go like, so they start at the boundary here and they actually go over, over there. And, and there is a split here when the, the path goes in there, this direction instead, right? And you, if I go back to the other picture, there are these height corridors between these paths, right? So this you would have here also that there are certain definite corridor heights that you have between these long structures. But then you can have loops and smaller things happening in between, of course, right? And here, right? So we hoped to prove that this actually converges to the airy process. We can't quite prove that. We can prove that if you count these corridor heights, how, what, how, what are the jumps in the corridor heights? This actually, in a weak sense, converges to the airy kernel point process. So we, we see this process here, but I, I can, we cannot prove that there actually is a definite large last path here which converges to this area area process right because i would have to say then that okay that nothing happens here but I, this is not easy now to capture using the, this castellane formalism recall that at the frozen rough boundary there was this last particle right this fits perfectly into determinantal processes but here, I mean, there is this very involved combinatorial this definition, right? It's this global long path. How do I capture this using these formalisms? So I can capture what I described, this kind of correlations and things. This I can compute, but there is no obvious way of really getting to, to, to this thing, right? So we can do some things there, which I will have, don't have the time to describe now. You can look at the two papers by Befara, Sunil, and me about this for more details. But here I just wanted to sort of emphasize that th this boundary is really not so easy to understand and to describe what you really see in the picture. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, we are not strict. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to, to continue a couple of minutes, no problem. I mean, no, no, no. no. Let's, okay. I, uh, yeah, let's. So, if there is any question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a question. Uh, I have a naive question, actually, not about the edge, but about the bulk. Because of the decaying correlations, does that mean you don't see anything? in the bulk of the gaseous region, you know, something like the sign process in the... No, no in, in the, this gas or smooth region, you, you, in the limit, you see, there you really see this smooth phase, right? So this has exponential decay, right? So it just continues to have this exponential decay, right? So, so, that, that the, so, so, so this means that there are small correlations maybe i should so, 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 so one and actually when we are right at the boundary so if i so if, if sort of this is sort of this last path that i was trying to define here right so so what, what I, this picture is a bit misleading because they seem to be you know it doesn't really change so much here right but of course this is the completely wrong right you have this this Recall the scaling set there. So you have this sort of last path, and the next path is about n to the one third away, and n is huge, right? So when I zoom in right at the boundary, I'm actually seeing this smooth face, right? And there is this, okay, now something was a bit different, right, which I tried to define. But you really see the correlations there are 
really the smooth face. And of course, if I move into the center, you, you just see this thing here, right? So, so to see any change, you really have to go a bit inside, as I, as I described there, right? And the reason, but of course, in the, there is also some structure on this, right? There are loops and there are th things attached to these paths. So there will actually be structures on this. Somehow the reason that you still get the airy process is that these small structures or backtracks that you could have here are a much, they, so the, the scales are still the same, but these are probably no, at most something like log app. So all these things happen at a much larger, smaller scale. Right? So in a sense, you should really have the same picture as we have at the other boundary. Uh, I, I have a question and comment. So the question is, did you consider the corners, the cusps, no, regions, or what happens near, near those? No, we have, uh, the, in, in the, I think in the, In the work, you can, we didn't carry out the asymptotics here. I, th I think that Arno Köhler and Maurice Deutsch did this to some. So I don't think, you know, if they comp uh, you, what you get here is, is just the Pearcy. So this, you have this sort of, so what you see here is actually, again, the background is this smooth face, right? And, and then you have a correction to that, which here, what I describe is involves this airy kernel, but here would involve the Pearcy kernel. So, you would so, have so, this... so which is the same as between frozen and, and, and rough, right? right? Yes, okay. yeah. So, so, so you, don't, you don't get any new kernels in that way in, in okay. the linear, yeah. right? So, okay. okay, and I have some comment, like in physics we know uh, examples of the exponential to power law phase transitions, which is an XY model, Berezinski, Kosovo's, Talis transition, or dislocation mediated crystals, which is probably one more relevant here. And the picture there is the following, that in a, in a, in a uh, smooth phase, there are topological defects which are bound in, in pairs, uh, sorry, which are decoupled. Yes. And, yes. and in a rough phase, they are bound in pairs of some size. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, if it's you vortex, are vortex, anti vortex. So you right, right. And that, therefore, yeah. at the distances which is much, much bigger than the typical size of the pair, you, you decay as a power law. So you are kind of ordered. Yes. But if you are at the distance which is much smaller than the size of the pair, you do not notice that they are paired. Right. And therefore, it, 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 it looks a lot like a smooth phase. Yes. So, right. I mean, this kind of physical picture corresponds to what you explained in terms yes. of Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, no, I think there is, I, I can't make this precise in any way, but there is certainly some similarity with this possible Saulus transition picture. I would be interested to discuss this a bit more. If, uh, I, look, I, I read about this many, many years ago when we worked by Frölich and Spencer and so on in mathematically, but uh, I'm not really able to, but, but yeah. there is a clearly similarity. You have this change, and, but I don't know how you, if you could map this in any way into some kind of XY model, I don't know. Other questions? Sorry, I'm very far away. Um, you were mentioning at the beginning that the first transition, the easy one between the frozen and the rough, is of the same nature of the ones that you see in random matrix models and that's an ensemble. Yes. Do we have an analog in random matrices for this other transition? No, not that I know of, no. I mean, that, you, you could ask this question in different ways. I mean, there are these orthogonal polynomial picture that you have on the, you know, there are the, in GUE, there are the Hemit polynomials and there are asymptotics behind that. Is there something similar here? No, not immediately in that sense. I mean, as Maurice Deutsch said last week, there are these uh, matrix valued orthogonal polynomials that you can find here, right? Which also occurs in, in, in random matrix theory with coupled models and so on. So, but I, I don't know of a way of really seeing this behavior 
in a random matrix model. Maybe more precisely, when you gave out as the three regimes, exponential, constant, and that with fluctuating regimes, those formulas are new for matrix models. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, I don't know of a matrix model where you would see the smooth things simply, right? I mean, I don't, where, where this would be something that you could, you have, you have the analog of the, of, of the rough face. I mean, this I didn't come to that. I mean, I mentioned this Pokrovsky Talapov that you have this kind of, of, of um, behavior of the height function. This is true at both of these boundaries, right? So in, in terms of the particle, so this, it reflects the height, right? The particles are sort of the, of the, is the derivative of the height. You're counting particles, right? So, so the, so the particle density actually goes to as d to the one half, and this is exactly, I mean, the, the, the what you have in the semicircle law, right, at the edge. Right? So, so in this, so, and this you have, you have in a way the same kind of regularity at the smooth at the smooth rough boundary but i don't know what it would correspond to in in a matrix model right so so here the here is sort of you have these eigenvalues right and there's this large large largest eigenvalue and you have this tracy widom distributions which you find here also right and this should also as i said have tracy widom distribution but i don't know of a picture here which fits it into eigenvalues or anything like that but it would be maybe there is but i i don't know of anything so, so it's a, it's an interesting good question in that way other questions if not let's thank kurt again thank you